today we have uh, the pleasure of having uh, Mr. Noor Bukholz, who is very well known to all of us. Uh, he is a big name in urolithiasis uh, and the urology. Uh, he's the president and founder of uh, UMERT, which is Urology in Emerging Countries, and also the expert in stone disease, uh, which holds regular meeting for the past uh, seven, eight years. I think the first one was in Dubai some seven, five, six, six years back, and correct me if I'm wrong. 2012, to be exact. 12, 10, so 10 years. About nine years. Uh, with him, we have uh, two panelists, uh, Dr. Zafar Zaidi, also a very well-known figure in uh, urolithiasis and pediatric urology. He's known to all of you. Uh, so he will, along with S.K. Pal, uh, our visiting uh, faculty this evening from uh, New Delhi, India. Uh, he's, he's a world-renowned figure in percutaneous surgery and urolithiasis. Hopefully, he'll be joining us shortly. So, Noor, uh, floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk here today. Um, so, I have put together a few interesting cases, and um, I will, after every case uh, or every step in the case, I will ask the panel to, to give the opinion, and then uh, the audience will have some time to think about their own choices and see whether that corresponds with what we have done at the end. So these are my disclosures. Um, the only thing I have to say is that I'm uh, thanking Olivier Traxair because I've used some of his cases here as well. So let's just start with the, with the first case. This is a 62 year old healthy female. She is of normal height, 164 centimeters not very uh, obese, uh, 72 kilos, not at all obese, I should say. And there's an asymptomatic ultrasound finding of a lower pole stone, 1.5 by 10 centimeters. So question is to the panel, what's, what's the next? Are you happy with that X-ray? Can you recommend a therapy? Well, um, if you look at the fracture of the spine and the osteocytes on the right side where the stone is formed, um, I would be a little concerned that there may be some so irregularity with the ureter, uh, may even have retroperitoneal fibrosis from it. So you do need to have some imaging technique which shows you the A, hydronephrosis in the kidney, B, the ureter, uh, so you can then decide what would be your best approach for the stone. Um, one would have otherwise have said a, a lower pole stone of this size, one can try and attempt a flexible ureteroscopy to get to it. But I would be very concerned that there may be some lingering ureteric, you know, something causing difficulty to get into the kidney from below. Absolutely. So... This and is and, knowing, and yeah. knowing you, you must have brought in a case which has something, you know, uniquely different. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, won't be, it won't be straightforward. <laughs> I think the international guidelines uh, all say that uh, you should have at least one contrast imaging uh, before you embark into any therapy because you need to know the, um, the anatomy. Um, so if you had to decide here on on treatment just on this X-ray alone, what would you decide? Uh, you said that already. You are as Hamad. You would uh, agree with the probably lower pole stone, 1.5 centimeters. Yeah, I think uh, once the imaging confirms uh, anatomy, I also see a large fibroid which is partially calcified in the pelvis. Yeah. So uh, there may be some issues with. Uh, uh, access from down below, but I think uh, I agree with Zafar that uh, anatomy description using additional form of imaging and preferably a, a, a CT would be ideal. Absolutely. So we agree on more imaging, right? Yep. Good. So this is the imaging. So what does that tell you? Slight medial deviation of the ureter, so there may be some something 
you know, just a slight. And do you but, actually see the stone in the kidney? Not very well in the x-ray that you provided. So was there exactly. the stone in the gallbladder? <laughs> there you go. Very well done, Zafar. <laughs> very well done. And that gallbladder stone was projected exactly over the renal pelvis. So yeah. without a sharp look like you have and without having any contrast, we would have done some sort of therapy without finding any stone in that kidney. So, the, fun, the fun would have been, no, you had done a ureteroscopy and removed a gallstone. Yeah, that exactly. would have been fun. <laughs> Good. Now, as we speak yeah. about deformed uh, spines, this is a 31-year-old female, spina bifida, uh, complicated by sleep apnea, a lot of comorbidities, and recurrent severe UTIs. And, so, apps, and the bones are completely demineralized, more or less. Yeah, almost glass bones, that's mm. true. And you see the stone? And the spine. Yeah, the spine, but also a stone, right? We see the yeah. stone. Yeah. Now, the first question would be, um, do we have to treat it? Do we have to treat that stone? With a recurrent UTI, probably the answer is yes. Ahmad? Yes, I, I agree. I think the stone does need treatment. It's a significant size stone. She is prone to UTI from... Absolutely, yeah. The UTI so, is actually the reason for the stones. Yes. She's likely to grow stones in size. So I, I agree that uh, it does, even if it is not. But, but I think the, the cause of stone here is rickets. If you look at the bones, they're in horrible mess. Okay, so patient is comes with this x-ray and you are in your clinic. And what's the first step you do? Put an antibiotic and send her home, try chemolysis, do a MAX3 scan, or do a bedside ultrasound of the left flank? Well, I think if you have an ultrasound available, you would want to do that, although you might find that information is not adequate um, on that ultrasound, still will give you some information. Okay, why? And, and why? I would put her on antibiotics as well. Yeah, okay. But why, why would I do an ultrasound here? What's, what's the rationale of doing an ultrasound? It's not so much to get the, we, we can do a CT scan, but th there needs to be a quick decision in the clinic whether you can treat this stone or not. So what am I looking for with an ultrasound? Yeah, you're looking for an obstructed kidney with hydronephrosis. Um, mm, yes, that, but I'm looking know, for something pyronephrosis. else. I'll give, you, I'll give you a hint. If the stone were on the other side, what would I be looking for? Well, are you looking for the vessels? No, I'm looking for a window of opportunity. Right, fair enough. I'm looking whether I can reach the stone through the flank, right? Okay. So that's the idea. If, if the stone were on the other side, I don't think that a percutaneous approach would be at all possible, right? Now, we haven't decided on the approach yet. So what would be the approach? I've kind of given it away already. Well, I mean, if for anybody who's, for lithotripsy, it's it's not going to work well um, mm. because, and then we don't have an, you know, correct anatomy in terms Absolutely. of radiology. So that, that won't do very well. RIRS may be an option, although the stone looks big. Um, you have to look at the fact that she may have difficulty in lying flat in any way. So that, that may force you to, Think in those terms. Open surgery would be my last choice if ever, if I were ever were to do it. Um, before even thinking about PCNL, I would really need to know where the viscera is. Can I access the kidney because of the uh, iliac crest? And I, in, in the past, uh, such cases, what I've done is I've actually used a CT scan because that gives you an idea where your other viscera is, uh, viscera are, and and. You know, if, there, if you can see some bit of the kidney, the hydronephrotic part, which is above the iliac crest, you might consider, you know, uh, putting in a needle into that kidney. 
again you used an ultrasound so if it is visible then you and so if you're good at using an ultrasound guided puncture it can be it can be attempted uh, yeah i think uh, a cutaneous approach and planning using uh, a ct would be ideal uh, you yeah. can also use your radiology colleague to put ct guided percutaneous access beforehand uh, if there is any concern about uh, injury to the viscera. Well, so, retrospectively, the access was actually surprisingly easy because uh, this little lady, I mean, she was very short, but because it was on the left side, everything has, had been bent wide open, right? On the right side, you would have had con considerable problems. You might have had an, an open approach for the right side. Um, and now I present this case and people say flexible ureteroscopy. Now, uh, apart from the position, you may find that also the ureter may, can be very, very torquous, uh, torqued and bent and uh, it may be very difficult to get into that kidney. And even if you get into that kidney, it may be very difficult for the fragments to come out. Mm. Uh, Noura, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, we have, uh, Dr. S.K. Paul joining us. Good. So, S.K., you know all of us. Uh, uh, we have uh, Noor Buchholz presenting his uh, sets of cases. Uh, Zafar Zedi, Professor Zafar Zedi from Indus Hospital, uh, our, our famous pediatric surgeon, pediatric neurologist, uh, and Ye uh, Khaksa. So, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Paul Saab. How are you? Long time. Welcome, been a very welcome, long time. welcome. Seeing you after a very, very long time. How are you? I am very fine. Thank you very much. Mm. I hope everyone is happy and comfortable with the pandemic. We have all come out of it victorious. This 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 version of it for the yeah. time being. <laughs> yeah, be careful. You know, it's a bit early to say that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, no seeing this case. Show that X-ray again. Uh, I think. No, I have seen it. You have seen it. Okay, right. I okay. have seen it, and uh, I just uh, wanted to make a comment because uh, if you see, probably even abduction of the hip joints will be a little difficult. Yes. and approach for the rirs may be very difficult while when the spine is bent like this left side it has already opened up and left side because there is a spleen which is a little far away not such a huge organ in most of the individuals this is a open invitation for doing a pcnl in this case such Absolutely. a wide area between the iliac crest and this uh, in such a anomalous uh, anatomy uh, there is a wide area you can see between the 12th rib and the iliac crest this is inviting for your needle to do the pcnl rather than approaching for rirs it will be difficult approach from below sometimes even access to urethra is difficult in these cases true so look at pcnl should be the first option on the left side and right side certainly the RIRS has to be done because liver and the anomalous uh, position of the kidney may be difficult to assess. Yeah, you this can is try the information if without, it were, without CT scan. If it were on the right side, then you could try a RIRS, but uh, you might have to resort to open surgery. Yeah, but we have to see the position of liver Absolutely. for the right side. How much this kidney is being encircled by the liver, how to approach that? Without CT, it will not be possible to decide about right side. Anyway, it was surprisingly easy to do a PCNL on this lady, as I as you said, and uh, she became stone free. Good. So next case is a 40 year old male, recently evaluated for recurrent headaches and vomiting for six to eight months. And he has no history of LUTS has pain in the abdomen and a normal renal function. So what do we see there? Well, we see a hip replaced on the right side. Yeah. There is what appears to be two shadows mm -hmm. in the bladder and they're quite different from each other. Yes. 
Any any other comment? Are these bladder stones? There is a bunch of radio opaque shadows just at the S3 level, S2, S3 level. Yes. Probably diverticular stones. Okay. And one large. This is the CT scan. <laughs> He's got a kidney in his pelvis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and not only that, he has a kidney with stones in his pelvis. <laughs> with, a, with a huge hydronephrosis, so likely PUJ of the kidney as well. Absolutely. So we have a left, uh, yeah, with an upper ureteric stone and a lower caliceal stone in that pelvic kidney. So what's the approach? Hmm. I mean, obviously, PCNL, lithotripsy are out here. Uh, you won't be doing it. But uh, if you can clear the ureteric stone using a flexible ureteroscope, um, you could do it. Otherwise, you know, uh, I think the old fashioned open procedure would be the other option. So this is the, the side image. You can see mm. the bladder, you can see the lower pole stone, you can see the upper ureteric stone, right? And what else do you see just along this? This. Yeah, you see more calcifications, right? Yeah, yeah. More calcifications. So this is a proper Steinstrasse, right? So you really want to do a RIRS, mm. you will be busy for a week. But can you? Puncture it from the top, a laparoscope assisted puncture. Yeah, laparoscopic assisted puncture, absolutely. That's what, what should be done. Okay, so this is the stone in the kidney. And on the right, you see the stone in the ureter. So, and you see the bilateral empty renal fossa. So it's a very interesting case. What did you do? Well, what would you do? So you said R I R S. What what would no no I mean, with the on, on the plane it was it'd be very difficult on on, on a, to okay, do so, a R I R S. Yeah. So why don't we ask Hamad and Dr. Paul? Dr. Paul, please go ahead. See, I'll keep all my options open. First of all, I do a ureteroscopy because there is a stain stress and see if the ureteric stones, whatever amount, can be removed and can be assessed from there. And how easy is the opening of ureteric orifice and going into the ureter? If I am getting successful, after that I will do a laparoscopic evaluation because in a transverse cut, it appeared to be just behind the urinary bladder. So transperitoneally, if you can see, that means do a laparoscopy and it's a hugely dilated renal pelvis. So even Trans, uh, means you can do either a laparoscopic guided PCNL or lepro, uh, laparoscopic pyelolithotomy because it's a huge and probably an anteriorly rotated pelvis which will be seen just on your face. Mm -hmm. So you can incise and do a laparoscopic pyelolithotomy with ureteroscopy. I don't know, maybe I will be lending it to a PCNL for the kidney stone, but anyway, laparoscopic guided. Ahmad? Yeah, I think uh, you have to keep multiple options open and uh, percutaneous access using some form of uh, CT guided imaging or laparoscopy, uh, removing stones from up to the mid ureter laparoscopically would be uh, would be much easier uh, than going from below and maybe doing the ECIRS or some form of uh, uh, simultaneous procedure from below. Uh, if you can partially fragment them and push them from, push it back into the kidney and, and remove it percutaneously. So any attempt to do significant work from below is going to take long time and it is, it is uh, will not be very fruitful. Yeah, so I agree with all, all of you that uh, it should be a combined approach an e as we call it, endoscopic combined intrarenal surgery. So uh, laparoscopic guided percutaneous nephrolithotomy and a URS, right? And then with the URS, of course, you try to come as far as you can. And with the, with, with the perk, you try to get as low as you can, right? And hopefully, eventually, the both will meet somewhere where there are no stones anymore. Good.
36 but, years. But, 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 yeah. if some, uh, no, but if somebody says that they would attempt an open procedure, they would not be wrong. Because, you know, this no, is... I mean, this is... Systems, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. The for, kidney, kidney and the balance is huge. So, you know... No, no, for this, you need, you need specialist expertise. Uh, and, you know, if you don't have that expertise, then you, you're better off doing it open. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Good. Here we have a 36-year-old woman, first stone former, no infection signs, not much symptoms. Um, you see on the arrow, there's a little stone. Um, yeah, what would you do? Get more information. Okay, yeah. Ahmad, Dr. Paul? Yeah, need I some more that... imaging, at least an ultrasound, maybe IVU or CT. Just a radio opaque shadow at L1, or sorry, L2, 3 level. Can't say, most probably a ureteric stone, depending upon symptoms, signs, microhematuria, all so those does, things. Does it happen in your hospital that somebody comes with an X-ray from outside, says, I have kidney pain, and you see this X-ray, and you say, okay, let's give it a try of ESWR? Or no. you always would, I mean, you know, there is the ideal case, and there is the practical world, the real world. Well, so, I, I, I'd start, if, if I were going to do anything blind, I would do MET blind. I would start them on medication um, without further investigation, if okay. at all. Not lithotripsy. Okay. The so, more common presentation is with the ultrasound. People don't come with the X-ray, but they come with the ultrasound. Okay. Is so this is the thing. this is the contrast study. So okay. now, what 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 do you see? Describe what you see and what you would do. Well, there's hydronephrosis on the right side with a de slightly denser nephrogram and the ureter seems to be, st uh, you know, obstructed at the, the stones seem to be obstructing the flow in the ureter. On yes. the left side seems to be all right. Yes. Uh, yeah. So that, that corresponds with that little stone, isn't it? Yeah, it does. This is definitely clubbing of calluses is there. And I don't know whether there is any delay in onset of function or not. But now, because that dense shadow of stone is not visible because of this density of the contrast. So I'll put both the films together side by side and try to analyze whether it is really the stone or something else. Most then, probably a stone. Yes. Well, it is where the stone is. It is where the stone is. So what, what would be the treatment, Hamad? Well, um, about 10 years back, I probably would be very keen to do ESWL with my electromagnetic lithotriptors. Uh, our enthusiasm of doing uh, ESWL now is, is less and less, particularly with the proximal ureteral stones and particularly stones which are multiple and in the ureter. Uh, it's, it's typically not possible to uh, get them into the lithotripsy suite on the same day. So they will probably will come back and one of the stone has gone down a little bit and it's probably not possible to do lithotripsy. I would be very keen to go in uh, with the consent of uh, flexible ureteroscopy, uh, start off with rigid and, and proceed. Okay, let me ask you, is flexible ureteroscopy now commonplace in all over Pakistan? Yes, it is. It is. It's getting there, it's getting there. Okay, because um, you wouldn't want to treat this with the, with the, with the semi-rigid one, unless you have a, say a four French or something, right? <clears throat> yeah, but, but the option of a push back and bang is certainly there, you know. I'm yeah, sure okay. it, it looks like a stone. You can just flush it back into the kidney, send it to the lithotriptor unit, and just just bang it. Yeah. So we have two options here. We have ESWL, and we have the retrograde intrarenal surgery to do this, right? Yeah. So e you know, no, I, I slightly disagree with Zafar. Uh, typically, these stone will drop into the lower pole calyx. True. And uh, then it's, it's, it's an issue, even small stones like this. 
it's an issue. Uh, I would probably be more keen to uh, go in with a uh, semi-rigid pyrotroscope. If I can reach up to the stones, I would probably use uh, low energy uh, laser and, and try so that there is no uh, ricocheting of stones back into the kidney as much as possible. Uh, because lower pole stones, even small, becomes, becomes problematic. Yeah, it's more difficult, that is true. Yeah, Dr. Okay, Bhan, so, so well, back to differ a little. This is the case where I will first ask for a CT scan and a non contrast CT scan to see the Hounsfield units of the stone and all the three dimensions of the stones. So, because kidney is functioning so well, and if the, all the three dimensions of the stone are less than five millimeter, I would like to give a conservative therapy with alpha blockers, maybe steroids a little bit for at least for a month and see if the stone comes down and gets impacted somewhere in the ureter. So just a rigid ureteroscopy will be all right or maybe by conservative means it will come out. Hounsfield units, if it is less than 600, only then and the patient is very symptomatic and size is more than five millimeter in any dimension, then I will send her uh, send him for a uh, ESWL if it is less than 600 Hounsfield units. Okay, so fair, my fair enough, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. yeah. So as this case is more than 10 years old, we tried ESWL and we tried it actually four times and somehow it didn't work. Then we attempted a retrograde URS and we found a severe kinking distal of the stone. The stone was severely impacted and we could not negotiate the passage, not even of a guide wire. Okay, so in that case, I would agree with you that uh, we, we should have had a CT scan to see the ureter below. And you see that the contrast does not give us any anatomical information about the uh, ureter below. So that in itself is not so bad, but then what happened is that the patient was lost for one year. She just didn't come back. She did come back after one year with a severe pyelonephrosis and 0% kidney function, and she ended up with a laparoscopic nephrectomy. Uh, why I'm presenting this case is, uh, especially for the residents, you know, just remember there are no straightforward, simple cases preoperatively. You can only say that after the procedure. So even a five millimeter simple upper uric stone has lost in this case to loss of the kidney function and a nephrectomy. I mean, the patient contributed, of course, uh, hmm. but yeah, that's right. what it is. So, so, so Noor, one of the questions from in the chat that somebody wrote was, why not, before you told us that it became non-functioning and you removed it, so why not a rigid ureteroscopy and dormia to remove it? Would you like to answer that? Well, because at that point it was a pyonephrosis. No, 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 yeah. no, no, no. Till the well, time they came back after a year in, in your initial... Yeah. Yeah. The question was asked at the time when you were initially presenting it. Oh, at the initial presentation. Mm -hmm. Why did we choose ESWL? No. Why not do a rigid ureteroscopy and a dormia basket? I'm just repeating what was said here. Well, a rigid ureteroscopy 10 years ago, when we had only like 10 French uh, uh, ureteroscopes, and then using a basket would be quite risky. Um, in the upper ureter. So I wouldn't have uh, dared to do that. Uh, with the advent of flexible scopes, or now where we have six French and four, even four French semi-rigid scopes, it's, it's, it's kind of a, differ a different story. But as Hamad rightly said, uh, the enthusiasm 10 years ago for uh, ESWO was much, was much bigger. And uh, uh, so we channeled the patient straight into the, you know, it was like, okay, a small stone in the upper ureter, let's crack it. And uh, actually the, the guidelines show that stones below one centimeter in the upper ureter are as well treated by URS as with ESWR. Yeah, and I think the, the, this, the Dornier basket is a dangerous um, you yeah, know, it's very device, dangerous. Yes. especially when the stone is so high up 
there's so much of the ureter it has to come down with and it can cause significant damage even in the evulsion of the ureter i've done it so you know uh, why to blame anybody else so one should one should not take dormia basket lightly the uh, recent segura tipless and the segura baskets are slightly better the dormia was a real terrible thing at that stage so that so for whatever whatever ureteric evolutions i have seen or heard or presentations this is the typical presentation yeah. where dormia basket yes. was used yes yeah. Yes. Just at that time, when you do dormia basket and try pulling out with the hope, no, that everything is comes out very small and simple. And this is the place where the ureteric evolution takes place. Absolutely. So a big, big no to dormia. Big no to dormia at this level. So I hope the gentleman who asked the question is got the answer. <laughs> okay, we have a seventy-one-year-old male, vague abdominal pain. On ultrasound bilateral hydroureteral nephrosis, and this is the X-ray. So we have a left distal Ooh. ureter stone, four and a half centimeters, a left renal stone, three by two and a half centimeters and a, and a bit, and a right ureter stone, one point five centimeters. The creatinine is one point two nine, so. Normal would be about 1.1, so it's slightly elevated or moderately elevated, I should say. And it seems the acetabulum seems to have pushed into the bladder. <laughs> well done, hip replacement. <laughs> 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 okay, so what uh, what would you do? What would you do? Well, I'll clear the right side first. So first, it's first, easy, first easier one. To... Yeah. Easier one, yeah, and maybe you know the left one. And I don't know what the what the hydronephrosis looks like, and what is the well? You said bilateral hydronephrosis. How bad is the kidney of the two between the well, two? Well, it's by, kidneys on ultrasound have good flesh, okay. so it's a bilateral hydronephrosis, and uh, the creatinine is going off. So would you would you uh, do a URS on the right, really? On the right, yes, I would do it on the right side, certainly. And nothing oh. the left, on the left. No, I mean, no, we are no. talking about the initial approach. Initial approach. Well, one can attempt the URS on the left side. It's going to take a very long time to to clear that huge big stone. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Hamad. Um, yeah, I mean, this is this is a bit too big. Uh, so, typically, what uh, sometimes you do is you <laughs> In an adult patient like this, uh, internal veotomy, and all the stone drops into the bladder, and you do a cystolithopexy. That's one oh, thing. For the right or the left? Uh, for the right side. That's uh, for the left side. Ooh. For the it right won't side. be an internal veotomy. It'll be a complete. You know, a yeah. <laughs> lot of the <laughs> <laughs> unless, <laughs> unless, unless, given, you know, there is, unless you can see a huge bulge inside the bladder. Yeah. That's a different thing. Then it's, you know, then it's something that you can cut on. Well, it's relatively high up. If you look closely at the x-ray, you see calcifications in the prostate, prostate yeah. right? And that's where next, that should be next to the orifices. So these are like four or five centimeters up, right? Hmm. They are actually where the ureter goes into the extra intramural part of the bladder. So I, my suspicion is they are just outside the bladder. Yeah, I mean somebody's mentioned why not decompress the kidney first. Fair enough. I mean if there's infection or, or there's a problem, you can always decompress first. Okay, so we have different uh, opinions, Dr. Powell. Very briefly, what would you do? Sir, I'll, with full enthusiasm, I'll spend time to do a right ureteroscopic lithotripsy, remove the stone, put a double J. Then on the left side, I will try if I can put a double J stent in this session through somehow digging a hole through the stone or maybe by the side of it with the help of ureteroscope. If possible, I will put it. Otherwise, just I'll call it a day. Then in next session, after because patient is uremic, the post-operative period may be little difficult and stormy. Once he or she settles down, 
then i will go for the left side and left lower stone will be better taken care of by laparoscopic ureteral lithotomy okay left this is the contrast stone. picture hmm. so good functioning left kidney yeah i mean uh, paul said why not yeah if once you've done the right side and let's say you can't get a dj up the left side why not put in a pcn if you are worried about drainage and 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 decompression yeah okay but and, and on on the first on the first setting on the first this setting. film before seeing this film i was thinking it will be difficult to pass a, a ureteroscope on the left side but now i can see there is a space around that hmm. just i have to go in that space and i'll be able to put the double j stent on the left side with yes. this film i'm a little confident right ursl and left dj stenting in first session so there will... you go there you yeah, go he's done it for you yeah exactly so that's i mean i'm a bit surprised that you all go for a urs in a bilateral um, block kidney with a elevated creatinine because uh, you don't want to add pressure injury water pressure injury to the tubular of any of these kidneys so what we did is we um, we decompressed both kidneys first we just put double j stents and waited for the creatinine to come back to normal right but that can be discussed of course um, so what is the definite treatment so you already said a few things here so we have the options of a pcnl obviously on the left bilateral urs pcnl left only and if i say pcnl a, a, option a would be also on the right side with an anterograde kind of uh, urs or a, a ecrs on the left and the urs on the right um in the interest of getting through the cases maybe short answers please so a b c or d safa well i i do the i do the urs on the right side um and uh, i think it will be very difficult to do a urs on the left side it's too big a stone i might be tempted in all honesty to do a ureteral lithotomy maybe laparoscopic or something leave a dj and come back and do the pcnl later on hamad um i'm reading at the options and uh, majority of our audience are opting for ecirs left and urs right mm, dr paul i think whatever right. you do this thing what i told you in the first setting right ursl left dj stenting yeah. in the second setting left laparoscopic ureteral lithotomy and pcnl yeah so would you in do this case yeah dr dr paul would you do the laparoscopic ureteral lithotomy at the same setting as pcnl yeah because next session i'll plan when the patient is quite stable she has uh, he has come out of the uremia he is uh, okay for the anesthesia long anesthesia i will plan for both rest depends upon the condition of the patient and anesthetist mm. good so this was done ecrs on the left urs on the right and the patient became stone free so a urs on the left was actually done and was successful you would probably use electro uh, kinetic or electro hydraulic uh, lithotripsy rather than uh, a laser on that yeah, stone yeah. but mm -hmm. it will work in the urogen okay 61 year old female history of stones bilateral flank pain chronic renal failure with a creatinine of about 300 high blood pressure and diabetes keep these things in mind chronic renal failure high blood pressure diabetes now very quickly what do you see on the x ray zafar uh, not much because it's a <laughs> not much is the right <laughs> answer hamad <laughs> yeah i mean uh, this some diffuse calcification i don't know if it's a uh, bowel with fecal matter or anything else yeah yeah uh, dr paul do you see anything can't make out anything sir anything okay. special yeah good so the options here so obviously everybody agrees on d no stones no well we can't really say we can't really say yeah well no. you don't see any stones yeah, so okay. you can say Sorry. that yeah, yeah. okay yeah. so What? you want some more imaging don't you 
we don't want to see this. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to you want an ultrasound, or you want a CAT scan, or you want a Max three scan, or you want an MRI? I have a CT scan. What CT can you be? Yep. CT can you be? Okay. Now, Zafar, what do you see now? A horseshoe kidney. With? Nicely placed with a stone on one side. Well, okay. somewhere at this thermos actually. Okay, now Hamad, the next picture. Okay. Same patient. Hamad. Hamad, are you there? Sorry, yeah. um, I'm, I was muted. So, uh, you see is a, is a malrotated kidney with uh, renal pelvic stone on the left side. Uh, the right side seems fine. It is, it's the same yeah. x-ray as the previous one, isn't it? It's, yes, it's yes, it's just another so, yeah. cut. All right. it's, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a horseshoe kidney, yes. Yeah, it's a horseshoe kidney. So this is the previous x-ray. Mm. Yeah. Okay. This is the so, same kidney. Okay, so one centimeter stone on the left. And Dr. Paul? Yeah, there is a right side also, there is a stone now. Absolutely. So we have so a bilateral kidney. renal calculation yeah. and very obliquely, obliquely situated kidney it is. The isthmus is seen in the first cuts, which is quite anterior, where the stone was seen in the first cut. As we are going posterior gradually and gradually, we can see the obliquely situated like this, the stone. The, yes. So it will be very difficult to remove the isthmic stone. Okay, so, so we have, yes, we have an isthmic stone, four millimeters and two one centimeter stones on each side. Obviously the stones are radiolucent, that's why you didn't mm. see anything in the beginning. Now the problem is the patient has an allopurinol allergy. I didn't mm. mention that in the beginning, okay? So she can't have allopurinol. She also has, as I said before, CKD3. She has a diabetes on insulin, and she has an uncontrolled uh, high blood pressure. And so, calcif calcified fibroids. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. That's not so much urology, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how would we treat this? Hmm. Well... Uh, now, PCNL. these are the options. Bilateral PCNL with maximum renal drainage and post-operative alkalization. Bilateral PCNL with maximum renal drainage and post-operative alkalization and antibiotics. Bilateral PCNL with maximum renal drainage and post-operative acidification. Or bilateral PCNL with nephrostomy and post-operative increased diuresis. I mean, why not give an option of intermittent uh, PCNL? Why want to do it bilateral in one go? Or are you meaning to say that you're going to do one and then later on another? Yes. Okay, that's a surgeon choice, but I'm not giving you that choice. <laughs> mean. <laughs> because I'm focusing more on the metabolic aspect here. So, okay. yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh using uh, oral dissolution therapy with CKD, particularly because you'll be using potassium citrate rather than anything else, uh, would, be, would be a problem because uh, hyperthalemia can become an issue. So- And she has an uncontrolled, and she, and she has an uncontrolled diabetes, uh, yeah. uncontrolled uh, high blood pressure as well. Yeah. So, so metabolic yeah. intervention in this is, would be a difficult thing. So what we need is, is endourology. Uh, one step or two step really depends upon uh, yes. patient choice and surgeon's choice. Yeah, and what you are saying is you should do the you can do the alkalization, but you do it through a nephrostomy, right? Yes, but that will be till the time you have the nephrostomy in place. Yes. Okay. So this is the right answer: bilateral PCNL, which is Dr. Paul surprisingly, as you might know, easy in a horseshoe kidney. Mm. With maximum renal drainage, maximum renal drainage means you, you have to maintain a low pressure system. 
and alkalization with SUBG and antibiotic protection because she is a diabetic and with this all this amount of plastic, which means two nephrostomies, two double G stains and a catheter, she's very prone for infections. Is there right. any place for chemolysis? chemolysis for yeah, alkalization chemolysis? is chemo, well. No, 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 no. I, you put in a PCN and do chemolysis through that. You mean only? Only. Yes, you can do that, but uh, you know, with that stone burden, two big stones, then the small stone not reachable. I, I don't know. Yes, maybe, maybe, maybe. But okay. then you need you need a very close monitoring because of her CKD, because of her diabetes, because of her uncontrolled uh, 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 blood pressure. You know, and uh, yeah. I mean, for these big stones, you have to keep her then in the hospital, I don't know, for months or so, mm. right? Whereas if you do it through the nephrostomy tubes, uh, after PCNL, after the stone burden is out, because the whole idea is to, to uh, dissolve little fragments that may be still in the system, then uh, the whole thing takes a week. Mm. Right? And for the, for the stone in the adestimus, I'd use a flexible scope through the yes. nephrostomy. Yes, absolutely. Implants, yes. Okay. But what do, do you say? mean by maximum renal drainage? What, say again? Yes. Maximum what? renal drainage means nephrostomy plus double gist and plus catheter. For how long and how it is going to help? If we just Go. do a tube as maybe a double gist stenting only, bilateral PCNL and double gist stenting on both sides. Yes, because you want no. a low pressure system, because what you don't want is that the SUBG uh, uh, solution is under pressure at any point in time and goes into her system because she uh, has multiple uh, metabolic problems. So if her base excess uh, changes, then that can be catastrophic. Okay. okay. Good. A uh, 37-year-old woman, left back pain and recurrent UTIs, history of kidney stone with left renal colic. Comments, mm. please. You can see the Short stone comments. in the kidney. We only have 10 minutes. Let's go, yeah. Let's go a bit kidney, fast. Kidney stones and you can see left distic, distal ureteric stone as well, possibly. Would you treat this stone and how would you treat it or would you further uh, want further imaging? I'd, I'd want a further imaging, certainly. Okay. They are looking like multiple small stones packed in a calyx or maybe a calicial diverticulum. Yeah. Hold on, hold on. This is your <laughs> turn. This is the further imaging. So, what is it? diverticulum. Yeah, is it so that was a question for Dr. Paul. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so That's what I mean. you're, you're probably right. There are several stones. And the reason these small stones can't come out is obvious here, right? So, Dr. Paul, how would you approach this? Straight uh, stone-guided puncture on the calicial diverticulum and remove the stone. After that, uh, I will try to find out the communication between the pelvic calicial system and the diverticulum by injecting either methylene blue or betadine from below. If I am able to find it out, I'll spend about an hour. If I am not able to find out, then I'll fulgurate the mucosa and come out. But if I am able to find out the opening, pass a guide wire, dilate it, and leave a nephrostomy tube through the diverticulum into the pelvic alicial system at least for five days. Absolutely. Now, Hamad, if I tell you this is a case of olivetraxia, <laughs> what is the alternative in treatment? Right. I think that's, that so, is clue enough, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. That's an easy one. So <laughs> everything is doable with this uh, flexible ureteroscope if you are Olivier. And uh, definitely what he's going to say that I will go from uh, below, I get into that in front of them, I try and pass uh, a guide wire, use my laser to do in front of or open it up in some way and, and approach the stones. But uh, this this is going to be disastrous because this is not going to clear uh, for, for a long period of time, irrespective of whatever you do. And I, I fully agree with uh, Professor Paul's comment that the best place to go percutaneously 
and try and do something to the uh, long, narrow and fundamental of this. Uh, okay, course. as you rightly said, if you're Olivier and then look at the right upper picture, that's the end result. Hmm. Right, so patient is- So since free. we are not Olivier, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I actually personally would have done what Dr. Pal is suggesting and what Ahmad is suggesting, absolutely. Good. So this is certainly not a rear's case for the beginner. 44-year-old female had a right nephrectomy for non-functioning stone-bearing kidney four years ago. And then she had a left flexible ureteroscopy and a PCNL six months ago on the left, and she came with these residual stones to us. What would you do? And she's had a UR, flexible ureteroscopy six months ago. She had a PCNL actually six months ago. So these are residual. She also had a ureter stone elsewhere, but these are the residual stones after PCNL. Single I kidney. Think, uh, yeah, I think single kidney stones, red residual stone. You try a flexible, uh, flexible ultrascopy, RIRS. Ahmad? Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. For, 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 for in percutaneous nephrototomy, there is always a possibility that uh, you have left something and which is in the parenchyma. So a flexible scope would obviously clarify that situation unless you do a contrast. Uh, if you look closely, it looks like this stone is adjacent to some fluid. So it may sit in a calyx, eh? Yeah, that's, that's possible. At least the, the lower one, the, the smaller one may be parenchyma. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so we all agree on URS, yes? Well, um, a, micro perk is, a micro perk is also an option. Dr. Pa? Dr. Pal, are you still there? Yeah, yeah. These stones appear to be embedded in the renal parenchyma, maybe in the PCNL track, the lower one. Good. And the middle one also doesn't appear to be in a dilated calyx. It will be very difficult to remove and may create more trauma to the solitary kidney. If the patient is asymptomatic, I will just wait and watch every year and see what happens. At present, if the patient is asymptomatic, there is no need to do over overdo anything at present. Just wait and watch and see. That's a very it is wise decision, and I tell you exactly why. So we have this beautiful new access uh, accessory, which uh, when you pump it, uh, gives you a beautiful view, uh, and we did a flexible ureteroscopy. Um, we inserted a double J stand. The flexible URS for this lower pole stone was uneventful. However, in the recovery, all of a sudden the pulse goes up, the blood pressure goes down. She developed a right bundle branch block, feeling acutely unwell, pain in the left loin area and no hematuria. So what's the next step? This is the scenario. Pulse up, blood pressure down, ECG changes, feeling unwell, pain, no hematuria. What's the next step? What do you think of? First, first deal with the blood pressure and the, you know, the ECG changes first, obviously. Obviously, but you need to know what's going on, right? So what, right. what would you do? What's I mean, the best imaging in this situation? A CT abdomen would be, I mean. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Let, let's go Good on a bit fast yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. absolutely. This is the CT. Gosh. A large hematoma, actively <laughs> bleeding, upper pole rupture in Good that single God. kidney. So I wished I had uh, known Dr. Pal at that time and he would have told me leave that kidney alone. So um, yeah, next step. Yeah. Embolize it. Very good. So, do we have to give fluids? Do we have to give antibiotics? Should we do a renal angiogram? All of them. Uh, all, all of them. Uh, yeah. All of it. Okay. So, this is the angiogram. In the left picture, you see the ruptured artery with some bleeding, and on the 
right side, you see after embolization, so the upper pole has become quiet, you see the coils in that limb artery. Can you all see that? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, okay. Now, patient was transferred, obviously she was in a hemorrhagic shock, right? She was transferred to ITU, had a septic shock on top of it, multi-organ mm -hmm. failure, renal failure and dialysis, five cardiac arrests, had a pacemaker put in, had a stroke with the left hemiparesis, had a pneumonia, and on top of all that had a dental infection. She spent two months in the ITU, you know, all of that for that little stone, or one month, sorry, had a CT scan, hematoma was consolidated, you barely see any hematoma there. You do see the parenchymal stone, the lower pole stone we had of course taken out. After two months, she actually made a full recovery with all that. Kidney function normalized, double J could be removed. And the only thing she was left with was a paresthesia of the left, of one left fingertip. So that was her reminder of this episode. So I and think we are very, very, very lucky in that case. And the surgeon, and yeah. the surgeon, and the surgeon was left with how much legal? <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, nothing. <laughs> yeah, thing. But take home message would be: think the unlikely, get independent input if you don't know what's going on, and be careful with these kind of pressure devices. Very fast, the last case, 28-year-old male, three centimeter renal pelvic stone with moderate hydronephrosis. Um, how you treat it? Obviously, we would all agree on a PCNL for three centimeter renal pelvic stone, right? Yep. Good. Um, so the procedure was under spinal anesthesia. The JJ was removed. It was prone. Uh, the puncture was through a posterior calyx a little oozing tamponaded by the amplats sheath and pneumatic lithotripsy was uh, used so far, everything according to the book. And then what we noticed, very few fragments in the kidney, but there were fragments outside alongside the sheath on image intensifier and the kidney was on inspection stone free. So what's the next step? Retrieve the fragments outside the kidney, put a double J stent, put a nephrostomy or put a double J stent and a nephrostomy? Mm. Well, I'd, I'd leave a nephrostomy, probably B and C. Ahmad? I mean, your stone fragments are outside because you've made, you've gone through the kidney and, the, and, and they're just lying all outside, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, obviously we have made a big hole there, yes. Mm. Mm. So Ahmad? nephrostomy and a DJ. So a nephrostomy is, is important, uh, leaving a double J stent and nephrostomy, I mean, is really an option, yes. And yeah. you need uh, drainage for uh, at least five days to a week so that uh, the hole in the kidney settles down. And obviously you don't chase the stone outside the kidney. Dr. Paul, three second answer, please. Uh, sorry, sir, there was some internet problem. I couldn't see it, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. This is what it is. No, so it, we had it, some it, fragments outside the sheath. It is the same case, stone same stone. case or new case? This no, no, it? it's a new case. Okay, okay, 28 year old male, sorry. So they did so a PCNL. Outside, some are yeah. inside, yeah. And so, the kidney was clear, the fragments outside. What do you do? Retrieve the fragments, put a double J, do a nephrostomy or all three, all B and C. Uh, see, if uh, a patient is young and uh, he or she has to be stone free completely, then definitely leave a nephrostomy and JJ both. When the thing settle down, then uh, try to remove everything. And second stage is always much easier, much smoother and more productive. These stones are outside the kidney. All stones are outside, inside nothing is there. No. Even, even then I will do a CT scan post-operatively because this is a uh, bizarre situation when some are out, some are in. Post-op CT will tell me whether there is some residual stones inside or not. If there are, then those have to be removed. Yeah, well, I'm telling you, we inspected the kidney and there were no stones. 
So what my colleagues did, they attempted to recover some of the fragments from outside the kidney, but they eventually abandoned it. I, I think it's not a good idea because whatever trauma there is, you, you make it worse. Um, so we agreed on an optimal renal drainage with both double J stent and nephrostomy. Um, the double J was a bit difficult because the, the you know, the, the resident decided to pull the guide wire out as well. <laughs> <laughs> so the patient had actually to be turned and into lithotomy position to get the guide wire up again. So now what happened is immediate post-operatively, there was a severe abdominal distension, rigid abdomen, sweating, cold sweating, no hemodynamic changes though, no dyspnea, but the toes turned blue and he had an erection. Mm. So what is it? Renal colic, wet dreams and the Reynolds syndrome, <laughs> intraperitoneal extravasation or retroperitoneal extravasation? It's the retroperitoneal extravasation. It's, it's, it's retroperitoneal. It's a retroperitoneal extravasation because approach was from the lower, uh, must have been middle or lower. Intraperitoneal, you have to go superior calicial through and through. Only then you can perforate the um, peritoneum and do a intraperitoneal extravasation. Well, you don't Lower do that. You, you don't know that. The only thing we know is that when my colleagues did this, uh, there was a se severe trauma to the kidney. Right? That's that's all we know. Um, how do you explain an erection and blue toes if it's a retroperitoneal extravasation? Compression. From the fluid, you know, that's probably being compressed. <coughs> the iliac is being compressed In, because intraperitoneal. If you do it, it it can take liters and liters of fluid before you you know it really causes any problem. Okay, yeah. so if we know it's an extravasation uh, for the erection, can we give anti anti androgens? Um, should we do a CT with contrast, an ultrasound, or a MAX-3 scan? Ultrasound, minimum. Yeah. Ultrasound. Good, ultrasound. Ultrasound shows a <laughs> large amount of free fluid in the peritoneal cavity. Now? Drain it. Drain it, how? Put where, wherever you've got the highest amount, ask the radiology to put a drain in there. Okay, so we have furosemide infusion, fluid restriction for a week, intraperitoneal drain, or none of the above? Intraperitoneal drain. Intraperitoneal drain. Good. So, a French 10 drain was put under ultrasound guidance. Two and a half liters of clear fluid were drained from the abdomen. It softened and the toes became normal again and the erection resolved. Creatinine normalized from 1.9 to 0 0.9 within two days. The patient was initially polyuric, but that settled. He had mild dyspnea so that the um, thorax surgeons, they put a drain in, but there was no fluid there. There was just a bit of atelectasis and the patient actually went home after four days in total. So this is the follow-up CT after one month. You wanna do something with it? Mm -hmm. You see the stones, you see a little bit of residual organized hematoma. It's not hematoma. It's, 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 it could be infected later on and certainly fluid there. No signs of infection. Hmm. You, you can still get it drained. Drain off the... the thing. Uh, Follow we, it up for did. six months. Follow it up for six months. Such hematomas, they may resolve spontaneously without doing anything unless they are infected. Yeah, don't, there are don't no concentrate on the, on the hematoma. I want to know what do we do with the stones. So we can do a retroperitoneoscopy to retrieve the extra renal stones, or we can do an extra renal PCNL with a transplant <laughs> sheath, or we can do a lumbotomy and remove all the stones, or we can just inform and reassure the patient. Inform and reassure the patient. Ahmad? Yeah, I agree. Uh, there are stones outside. There are stones in the renal parenchyma. And I think I, I would wait, uh, get a proper uh, study to see 
if there are any intractable seal stone and then decide to do yeah, they're not. The rest they're not. The All the stones are, as so, you said, so outside you or in the yeah. parenchyma. So it's, it's only a cosmetic issue on yeah, the next exactly. trip. Exactly. Yeah. Inform and reassure the patient. So now um, we've come a little bit over the time. So I want to invite all of you to our stone conference, experts in stone disease, organized by you, merged together with the Greek Society of Urology and the International Urolithiasis Society on the 10th and 11th of June in Athens, Greece. You're almost welcome. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share my cases and hope to see you all soon uh, in person if COVID allows. Right, thank you very much, thank uh, you. Noor, Zafar, uh, Dr. Eskepal. Uh, always a pleasure to have uh, all of you guys, uh, the big time experts on stone disease, to be here to discuss and uh, educate our residents about uh, complex situation at times when you do face them on endourology uh, quite regularly. Uh, I uh, the, the next uh, course is on first uh, Saturday of March, and uh, our guest would be Ananda Danasekran, who is a urologist uh, working in Birmingham, and uh, he will be uh, taking up uh, exactly topic will be communicated shortly, but uh, he'll be talking mostly about BPH and low immune tract symptoms uh, and some of the newer advances in the management of BPH. So hope to see you again um, next, uh, the first Saturday of uh, March. Uh, and again, thank you very much to all of you. Uh, I apologize to the, to the participants. Uh, there were some, a lot of questions, but because of the short time, we, we cannot address uh, these questions. One last question, one comment from Escapal, and, and this was a question coming in the chat box about his choice of, uh, of uh, imaging study. Uh, is it still IVU or uh, do you use CT more frequently and is it with contrast or without? I think uh, at least in my practice, uh, the standard is now CT IVU. Okay, Dr. Paul. We have to be uh, very much uh, economically driven decisions so um, usually we prefer a non-contrast CT scan and a ultrasound. If any contrast study has to be done, then definitely we would go for IVU because CT urography comes out to be more expensive and less informative as compared to a combination of non-contrast CT and IVU. Thank you very much. And for these words, Mubakholz, Dr. Zadi, Eskipal, have a very good evening. Thank you, Salaam alaikum. Very nice seeing you, Dr. Pal, after such a long time. Take Dr. care. It is really a pleasure. Pleasure seeing all of you. Yeah. Noor, Noor, you always rock. <laughs> <laughs> He's <laughs> got so many rocks with him. <laughs> yeah. Let's see, some, let's see some old rocks in the columns. In yes, the yes. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everybody. Bye -bye. Good night. Thank you very Good much. Night. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>